made it happen like a lot quicker or we look back on the earth and we were able to help um, life here on earth because of something that we never even thought of because of, of the little project called LRO. That, that would be great. That would be awesome. May 15, 1963. The place, Launch Pad 14, Cape Canaveral, Florida. The event, Project Mercury's final manned flight in Earth orbit, forerunner to Projects Gemini and Apollo in the nation's space program. Witnesses of the event, the people of the world, on the site in Florida, at television screens throughout North America and Europe, and at radios on other continents. High above Cape Canaveral, an aerial camera records the launch. The primary purposes of the fourth American manned orbital flight were to confirm how well man can function in space during a day and a half of weightlessness and to test the efficiency of the human being as a primary component of a space flight system. The story then begins and ends with man. Man is a living, thinking element of the space flight system, and the man is an individual, the man who named his spacecraft Faith Seven, for his faith and for his friends. The individual, Air Force Major and NASA astronaut Leroy Gordon Cooper, Jr. What events in his life led to his selection as the man who would take America's longest stride in space? He began flying at an early age. He soloed at 16. He became an Air Force lieutenant and jet pilot at 22. He also obtained an aeronautical engineering degree and qualified for the daring and methodical work of a test pilot. By the time he was selected as an astronaut, he was a trained, experienced test pilot of supersonic jets. But the demands of space flight were new, beyond anything previously demanded, even from a supersonic test engineer. New knowledge was essential, new academic training, from astronomy and celestial navigation to studies such as astrodynamics, spacecraft structures, bioastronautics. As an astronaut, Gordon Cooper entered another world of sensation, such as weightlessness, the absence of gravity, which can be simulated on Earth for only brief periods. He underwent hours of training on centrifuges, experiencing the forces of acceleration. He learned special breathing techniques to help him function under the crushing forces of liftoff and re-entry. He learned firsthand the sensations he would encounter in a tumbling spacecraft and learned to control the craft's attitude in various dynamic conditions. Astronaut Cooper flew dozens of training missions on the ground in space flight simulators. He learned operational procedures and emergency techniques. He became as familiar with his Mercury spacecraft as with his own home. And if something went wrong with that spacecraft, he was trained to survive on the desert, in the open sea, wherever he might be forced to land in an emergency. By the morning of May 15, 1963, Astronaut Gordon Cooper, engineer test pilot, was as ready to orbit the Earth as his own intelligence and the resources of science could make him. Ready as a man, a highly qualified person. But more than that was required. He must also be prepared as the component man, part of the control loop of a space flight system. Obtaining medical knowledge of man's mind and body in a period of sustained space flight was the most important goal of the mission. To take his temperature, a new oral thermometer was used. When not in use by the astronaut, it is stowed on the right ear muff of the helmet and serves to confirm suit outlet temperature. It consists of a thermistor embedded in a latex probe and has a range from 75 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Delicate sensors obtain heartbeat and respiration rates. 
They're placed on the torso and under each arm at the sixth rib level. An electrolyte material aids in conducting the electrical signals. This tiny microphone is worn by the astronaut for taking his blood pressure. It is positioned over the brachial artery on the upper left arm. To measure his blood pressure, the pilot presses a button on his instrument panel. A special cuff is inflated on his arm, much like those in everyday use in a doctor's office. The electrical outputs of the microphone and cuff pressure, like other bodily measurements, are fed into this single telemetry unit, are converted into electronic signals, and transmitted by radio to doctors on Earth. Repeated use of this exerciser during flight was also programmed to yield additional cardiovascular data on exertion while weightless. Relatively free movement of his hands and arms is possible for the astronaut during normal flight since his suit is not normally pressurized. The atmosphere within his cabin is maintained at a life-supporting pressure. In an emergency, however, should the cabin lose its pressurization, the suit would be automatically pressurized to protect the astronaut. A careful test of the suit is made just before flight to be sure there are no leaks. When Gordon Cooper left the astronaut preparation facility, Hangar S at Cape Canaveral, to board the transfer van that would take him to the gantry, he knew that his spacecraft had also been prepared for the mission with meticulous care. Faith 7 had been mated to its Atlas launch vehicle days before. Over 100 changes had been made from previous Mercury spacecraft, time-consuming changes in miles of wiring, in solenoids, valves, dials, and even in screws and bolts. The most important ones, such as removal of the periscope, were designed to reduce weight and increase space for storing greater quantities of consumables, oxygen, attitude control system fuel, food, and water. New instruments, such as cameras, antennas, and a metal sphere with flashing lights. In addition to medical studies, 12 special experiments were scheduled. The 95-foot space vehicle consists of the reliable three-engine Atlas booster and sustainer, the spacecraft, and the escape tower. Mated together, these major components of Mercury Atlas 9 were a towering tribute to the energy and brains of the nationwide industrial team which created and united them. From almost every state in the Union, materials, designs, parts, components, and assemblies had come to this Florida beach from the thousands of men and women working in the nation's effort to succeed in space. No one was more aware of the work of more than 50,000 people leading up to this moment than astronaut Cooper as he entered the spacecraft. He was fortified by the knowledge that thousands more would be standing by from Mercury Control Center to stations around the world. Emergency rescue forces were ready to come to his aid in the event of failure or catastrophe during liftoff and other rescue crews were stationed at strategic points beneath his flight path in case of emergency landing before the completion of the programmed 22 orbits. The day before, the MA-9 flight had been postponed due to a radar problem at the Bermuda tracking station. The man, the space vehicle, and the support systems must check out 100% before liftoff. There's no margin for error when a man is launched into the void of space. On May 15, 1963, the countdown proceeded faultlessly. Woomera, how do you read? Uh, Roger, Canton, how do you read? Uh, status is green, clear with background noise. Roger. Around the world, all tracking stations were green for go. This is Texas Capcom, read you loud and clear. All status is green. Roger, Eglin, M&O, how do you read? Eglin, M&O, reading you loud and clear. All status is green. Roger. Test 465 is at T-minus 24 minutes and counting. MA-9, the vast and intricate edifice itself, responded perfectly to the careful scrutiny of men like those who had built it. Stand by for status. Airman, go. ECS, go. Sequence, go. Electrical, go. ASCS, go. RCS, go. Tom, go. TM, go. CO, go.